The Tower of Xenopus is the much beloved sample dungeon from the original Holmes basic set of Dungeons and Dragons. Considered by many to be the sample dungeon champion of the world, Jonathan Rowe of the Fen Orc blog has taken on the daunting task of penning a sequel beneath the ruined wizard's tower. How does it compare to the original? Coming right up on RPG Retro Reviews. I'm Captain Courageous and I review old school modules and games and try to give them a fun and informative analysis. This week I'm taking a look at an OSR module released by Fen Orc blogger Jonathan Rowe as a direct sequel to the venerable Xenopus Tower sample dungeon from the original Homa's basic set of Dungeons and Dragons. My deep affection for that dungeon probably stems from the fact that it was the very first adventure module I ever ran and over the decades I've ran it quite a few times as the beginning foray for one campaign or the other. This module was written with an eye towards using the Blue Home OSR rules from Dreamscape Designs, but fundamentally can be ran with any OSR rule set or the original D&D basic rules. Blue Home, of course, is the rule set designed by Michael Thomas, which I reviewed on this channel as well. This OSR is a continuation of the Home's Basic Rules set that takes the design aesthetic set down by Blue Box D&D author John Eric Holmes, which only went to 3rd level, and extends it all the way to 20th level. The sample dungeon provided by Holmes in the original D&D Basic Rules is rather subtle in its design. It doesn't overtly suggest any particular storyline itself and is a hallmark of of sandbox dungeon design, but in the playing of it, several storylines will most definitely suggest themselves. A cursory look at Holmes' map doesn't show any particular rhyme or scheme to the thing, but careful reading of the dungeon's background and the encounters contained therein reveals that indeed one exists. The northern part of the dungeon is the catacombs area. Their adventurers will uncover undead and an extension of Port Town's nearby graveyard. To the south is an evil magic user, a thaumaturgist, who is exploring the ruins of Xenopus's underground lair to try and uncover its secrets. The central portion of the complex contains a few oddities. There's the question answering brazen head in room I, the rotating statue that controls the dungeon's central hub in room D. There are goblins in room A, possibly in the employ of the thaumaturgist, though that's entirely conjecture and up to the individual DM. There are pirates in the sea caves to the west, and a giant crab lurks in cave L, ready to pick off stragglers that may have gotten separated from the main group. The pirates use the sea caves to traffic their ill-gotten gains, and they have a captive, the Munda the Lovely the daughter of a prominent council member in Port Town. Further, one of the pirates wandered too far east in the dungeon and has ended up a charmed slave of the thaumaturgist. Resolution of the dungeon usually results in defeat of the evil magic user and the rescue of Lamunda from the pirates, and leaving several threads open to exploration by players and the DM. The background mentions a pre-human city and suggests the dungeon has many levels. There are the catacombs and rat tunnels to the north, and where they lead is left undefined, and of course the pirates are certainly going to seek revenge on the player characters for foiling their kidnap plot. Not too shabby for a simple four-page sample dungeon. Jonathan Lowe's adventure Beneath the Ruined Wizard's Tower, the title of which is drawn from the final line in the dungeon's background, takes those suggested story threads and extends them out logically. The adventure offers several fun surprises and is a clever adventure in its own right. Lowe follows Holmes' design aesthetic, keeping the same ratio of empty rooms to encounter rooms, and offers a size increase of 74%. Of course, 
Spoiler warning, past this point I will be giving away some, but not all, of the surprises on this level. Like Holmes, this second level is also broken up into specific theme sections, and many of them quite cleverly connect back to the first level, and are a continuation of the themes suggested in the original dungeon background. Lowe also introduces the concept of the Dungeon Constable, a dingleman who guards the dungeon's entrance to prevent interlopers from disturbing things that weren't meant to be disturbed, but more on that in a moment. Like Holmes' original dungeon, the second level is broken up into several sections, as you can see here. There's the Corsair's Lair, the Temple of the Rat God, the Priest Human City, and the Crystal Labyrinth. If you're familiar with the original sample dungeon, quite a bit of that will sound familiar from Holmes' original background. There are three means of egress to the second level from the original first level. The first connects via a small aisle called the Smuggler's Isle in the middle of the sea caves in room M from level 1. There can be found several barrels of supplies. The isle can be seen from the shore of room M as a light shines from it over dark waters. There is a rickety wooden jetty on which rests the lantern and several barrels of supplies. There also can be found a spiral staircase cut into the rock that descends 50 feet to areas A through K and that leads to the Corsair's Lair. The second means of egress begins in room I of level 1, the room of the brazen head. In this mysterious room is a large brass mask affixed to the wall and a sundial. Upon entering the room, the mask speaks and says, I'll answer a question one, no more. I'll not speak to it before. If a torch is so held as to allow the shadow to fall over the number 4 on the sundial, the mask will say, Speak, I'll answer. Essentially, the PCs can ask the mask virtually anything, and this particular oddity of Mad Wizard Xenopus's lair will answer truthfully. Thus, the PCs can learn a lot of things about the dungeon with several visits. In this case, if they ask, where's the second level, or where did Xenopus go, the mask will say, Behold. and a section of the floor will slide away and reveal a staircase that descends to level 2, areas S through Y, the pre-human city. Room I is my favorite room from the original dungeon, and I just love this clever addition. Finally, the third entrance can be found via the rat tunnels to the north of room N. Here the tunnels twist and turn downwards until they emerge in the Temple of the Rat God. The Corsair's Lair is pretty slick. It's an old tomb of legendary pirate captain known only as the Corsair who harried the coasts back when Port Town was a mere village. Apparently, the ghost of the old pirate was awakened when Xenopus originally explored this area a century ago. Since then, the Corsair has recruited smugglers to be his human servitors, while he gradually raises an undead crew to ravage the coast once more. The door to the tomb reads, Here lies he whom all coasts fear, and waits in death for his love to appear. In the hidden treasure room, a tapestry can be found, the image of which is a beautiful woman in fine robes, the Corsair's lost love. Interestingly, the woman's looks are exactly those of Lamunda the Lovely, the second-level fighter that had been kidnapped by the smugglers and found in room M of the original dungeon. So it turns out that Lamunda wasn't just to be held for ransom, but a more sinister purpose, to be reunited with the Corsair. It's a nice little twist. I really appreciate. This section is really creepy and there are quite a few briny encounters with undead pirates, the beginnings of the Corsair's new crew. It might be interesting if, after rescuing her, Lamunda the Lovely accompanies the PCs on their explorations of this new level. Exploration of this section of the dungeon includes an exciting encounter over a perilous chasm that potentially can lead to the dungeon's third level 
but leads directly to room K, which is a cavern of ghosts. As the BZs enter the room, each encounter one of the Corsair's victims with random results. Some that are helpful, others not so much. Here a PC can be possessed, attacked by a shadow, given a magical ring that allows protection from energy drain three times, a magical cutlass, and so on. Sections L through P is the Temple of the Rat God. Those familiar with the original dungeon might remember that there was a series of maze-like rat tunnels in the north of room N, which resided giant rats. Here an explanation for that area is provided for those tunnels twist and turn and go downwards and emerge on the second level. Here a strange gathering of giant rats have nested near a shrine to the god of rats. There is a cult as well that worship the thing, led by their high priest Lowell Treb, who himself is a weir rat. The other cultists are mere human acolytes, poor town residents, and they wear robes and rat masks. Ideally, the worshippers wish to be infected with lycanthropy and become weir rats themselves, and to that end there is a sacrifice seemingly held captive in room M and potentially rescued by the PCs. Osbird the Unready. Osbird will beg for release, of course, but he's also a weir rat, and there just might be treachery afoot. The true sacrificial victim is being held in room R, the luxurious prison. As for the cultists, not all of them are eager to die for their cause, and the module provides a non-combat resolution for the rat worshippers if a positive reaction result can be achieved. Some only care about becoming weir rats and are a lost cause, while others might be able to be convinced to throw down their arms and return to Port Town peacefully. This section also holds a nasty surprise in room L. This is the main nest for the rats of the rat tunnels, and an exceptionally beastly mother rat along with her progeny can be found here for a particularly nasty encounter. Area S through Y is the pre-human city. Here the upper chambers of a much larger expanse can be found, and like the first level of the sample dungeon, offers a few zany encounters, including a second brazen head. There is room S, the chamber of the scepter, a room with numbered squares that offers an interesting and clever puzzle and combat with crystal statues. Further, Xenopus's laboratory can be discovered, but the wizard or his remains will not be uncovered here. There is the crystal portal, and if one possesses the scepter from room S, can activate it. The portal can lead to another dungeon of the dam's choosing, the beach of the sea caves, other areas on second level, the Green Dragon Inn in Port Town, or anywhere else the DM so desires, though it's potentially possible with time for the PCs to learn to control the scepter and its transportations. There are other clever encounters here, including one with an actual denizen of the aforementioned pre-human city. Finally, there is the Crystal Labyrinth. Here is a dazzling maze of caverns made from an indestructible crystalline material that reflects light and images in kaleidoscopic confusion. Due to the strange reflective nature of the place, getting lost here is an absolute certainty. While within the peculiar caverns, characters do not age and food does not spoil. Within the maze of caverns reside the crystal spiders who will attack lost and confused travelers, their bite turning victims to crystal, which will ultimately meld with the cavern walls in 1d12 hours. The module leaves a lot of mystery yet to be uncovered, such as the connection to Lamunda the Lovely and the Undead Corsair. What about the secret society of rat god worshippers and their influence on Port Town? What's at the bottom of that massive chasm? Where else does the crystal portal lead? Where is Xenopus? What was the ultimate fate of the mad wizard? whose legend inspired these explorations to begin with. Lowe mentions that he intends to provide a third level to the module to be reached via the Perilous Cavern, which, based on this work here, I would love to see come to fruition. 
Lowe finishes out the module with some commentary on the dungeon's design and commentary on the dungeon constable, or the Dingleman, appointed by the town council, the task of which is the policing of a dungeon estate, keeping out trustbusters and warning neighbors if monsters emerge. Harming or killing the Dingleman is a capital crime. The Dingleman's other duties include policing the graveyard for trespassers and grave robbers and emerging undead. The module introduces an NPC named Brubo the Hooded, a third-level lawful cleric who is the town's official Dingleman. The module also suggests that Brubo patrols the first level of the dungeon and it's possible for the party to encounter him there. I'm not exactly sure I'm on board with that aspect of the position. There are several elements in the initial dungeon that would seem to be negated by the Dingleman's presence, such as the goblins in room A, or the chaotic evil thaumaturgists in room F, as well as the presence of the smugglers. Thus, I would say that Brubo patrols the ruins area and the graveyard, but doesn't actually enter the dungeon. If I were to have such a thing in my campaign, and it certainly makes sense for a township to create such a position if it is known that there is a close underground labyrinthine complex occupied by monsters. This module is freely available at DriveThruRPG as a free PDF download, or you can order a saddle stitch print on demand copy for just $2.99. So let's go ahead and take a look at Beneath the Ruined Wizard's Tower on my D20 scale of style, presentation, and value. Style-wise, there's nothing to write home about. The artwork is public domain, except for a few pieces by artist Sheridan McGuire. But considering that this is a free download product, there is no reason to expect anything else. So I'm not going to be too critical here. I'll rate this a 16. As far as presentation goes, everything is laid out and explained extremely well. The copy I got seemed to have been pretty comprehensively edited. I found a few spelling or grammar mistakes, and the layout is actually very professional looking. There are a few places that seemed a little unclear to me as to how they were to be executed, such as the Scepter Room, which utilizes the Fibonacci sequence. It's an interesting puzzle, but I'm not exactly sure how common players will recognize such a thing. The Fibonacci sequence is a series of numbers. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, and so on. Each number is in the sequence is derived by adding up the two numbers preceding it. 1 plus 1 is 2, 2 plus 1 is 3, 3 plus 2 is 5, and so on. The safe squares all corresponding to numbers in the sequence. Interesting puzzle though. That said, this module is a phenomenal sequence to Holmes' work. There are a lot of nice callbacks in this module, but they are original ideas also in themselves. The concept of the Corsair and his lost love linking to Lamunda the Lovely, for example, or the way the second level entrance links to the brazen head mask in room I, and so forth, are all quite clever. I love how this dungeon has its own sections, each of which is really a mini-adventure in its own right, and certainly this level will take several game sessions to complete. I'll rate this an 18. Finally, let's talk value. How can you downgrade from free? Certainly there are modules of this type that have little redeeming value, but this is definitely a major standout, which is why I'm even reviewing it, as I feel it deserves some attention. Also, it's available for print on demand for just three dollars which as you can see here will fit quite neatly in your home's basic box set i'm going to give this a natural 20 critical hit that brings the overall rating for this module to an 18 very good Thank you all so much for watching. I've still got a lot of great reviews coming up on old school modules, games, and OSR products, but as I'm sure you've noticed, my video production has slowed considerably recently. That's because my DJ schedule looks pretty darn comprehensive. It looks like this, which is great, but it plays havoc on research and development of my video reviews. I've been trying to finish up this particular video for a week now. I'd like to thank all my patrons who continue to support the channel month after month. Without you, these videos 
would not be possible. Please give this video a like, comment, and share. Please check out my Teespring store for great gaming swag, t-shirts, carry bags, coffee cups, and more. Join the channel's Facebook page, RPG Reviews, and consider supporting the channel by becoming a patron yourself. Or alternatively, you can just send a tip through the PayPal tip jar. A link is in the description. And as always, my friends, may your d20 roll true and game on.